Hi and welcome back to Terry Talks Movies. I've got a new camera. Yeah, for those of you who care, it's an Insta360 Link. And it's kind of a web camera, but it's very sophisticated. I'm happy with it. And I've got to keep looking down at the screen here, so I apologise for that. Put my hat on straight. Um, yeah, I could do weird things with it like this. And it will follow me around. I've also got... I can change the angle of it with a click of a mouse, so I can show you the new shelf I have for my camera gear which is there or the big shelf up the back of the room which is there or the TV set which is down there and then I can go back to where I was and it just takes a little moment or two to adjust to that so AI smart camera 4k gotta love it but let's move on with the movies this time I've got three kind of quirky lesser science fiction fantasy and horror movies I've got one of each so something for everyone the first one I'm going to do it costs seven thousand dollars. It was made in two thousand and four by uh, Shank Ruth and also stars David Sullivan. Shank Ruth is the director, the writer, and the producer of a little film called Primer. Now, if you haven't seen Primer, to be honest with you, it's a little bit tough to get into. It's about a couple of engineers working in Silicon Valley, two guys called Aaron and Abe, who do entrepreneurial tech projects in between their kind of day jobs. So they've got a side hustle doing um, little circuit boards and things like that and they work out of Aaron's garage with a couple of other friends and one of the interesting things is they start getting some weird results on an experiment that Abe and Aaron are doing as a side hustle to their side hustle. There was value in the thing, clearly, that they were certain of. But what is the application? In a matter of hours they turned it to everything from mass transit to satellite launching, imagining devices the size of jumbo jets. Everything would be cheaper, it was practical, and they knew it. What they're shooting for is to electromagnetically reduce the weight of objects. But then they start getting some weird distortions in it. And as the movie progresses, they find out they've created a time machine. Anything put into the box will go back and forth in time. But if you open the box at one end of it, it results in them traveling backwards in time. And there's a ratio between how long the object's in the box and how far they oscillate back and forth in time. Lots of complex physics in this one, but if you put the subtitles on, you're going to follow it pretty well. So Aaron and Abe decide to upscale. They get a storage unit and they put into kind of large coffin sized time machines so they can travel back in time. There are a couple of complications. They've got to flood the unit with argon, so they need to have oxygen tanks on. And it gets a bit claustrophobic and there are a few physical side effects to the deal. But as they go back and decide they're going to monetize this by playing the stock market, they'll get the share prices on the things that have really gone up and go back and buy them, that kind of thing. But you have the suspicion that things aren't quite right and that they've already been to the storage unit before they start creating the time machine. So the time machine is actually from a previous loop in the cycle of their time travel. It's a bit of a mind spin, this one, and it really does bear close watching to. Uh, and one of the things you should watch for, and I only found this out about the second time I watched the film, is you've got to watch carefully the camera angles, because some of the camera angles that are shown suggest that the Aaron and Abe we're watching are being watched by some other Aaron and or Abe from a different time loop. It's one of those movies that kind of confuses the hell out of you. There are endless videos on YouTube explaining the time loops in Primer. But for $7,000, I think it's great. Shanker has made it in his own house. He uses friends as crew and, and cast in some parts of it. And he used local locations where, around where he lived. And they filmed it on 16mm film. So it's, it's got that kind of low budget aesthetic about it made a lot of money for such a low budget movie let me have a look at the numbers on it because they're always interesting budget was 7k and the box office it says was 841,000, which is a good return on investment really which is one of the things the guys talk about a lot now the themes of the movie are interesting as well 
One of the things is that both Aaron and Abe are engineers. They're not scientists, they're engineers. And so they, for the first time in their adult lives, come up against the moral implications of what they're doing as engineers. And they are inadequate in handling that. They really don't have a moral compass that will enable them to navigate this breakthrough in a meaningful way. And the resolution is kind of satisfying but a little disturbing at the same time. There are implications that things in the future are going to be a little dangerous, let's say. And um, if any government ever gets hold of them, they're going to get even worse. That's not implied by the movie, but it's an implication of what we see in the film based on what we know of the real world. Now, the actors aren't particularly gifted, but they don't need to be because both of these guys are very kind of engineering and many people I know who are engineers are, are somewhere on the autism spectrum and there is the suggestion that even though Aaron is married with a child he does have trouble in his relations with other people in that way that uh, people who are on the spectrum often do. Now we, we find more and more there are a couple of kind of third act revelations that really blow your mind when you watch it. But this movie is is really interesting. Now, there's a good Blu-ray of the film, and I'll just bring it up and show it to you because I can zip the camera around and show you a Blu-ray disc just like that. This is the Arrow Films version of it, which also includes um, Shane Crew's second feature film, Upstream Colour, which is even stranger and weirder and much more um, freaky in some ways and shot um, on high definition, so it looks a lot better than Primer does itself. But Primer and Upstream Colour together are really interesting films. Now, Shane Carruth is a problematic character. I'm not sure where his career is going to go from here. There have been two domestic violence charges against him by his partners at various times, and people like that are people that Hollywood tends to steer away from. I can understand why, and I can respect the reasons why. But he was coming out of that time around the turn of the century when there were some interesting filmmakers like Andrew Nicole and Vincenzo Natale turning up and making some really interesting things. And by the way, Vincenzo Natale is one of the producers and one of the directors on a series Amazon has, The Peripheral, based on the novel by William Gibson. That you should check out because that's really an interesting piece of science fiction. I may do a whole video about it. Let me know if you want me to do it. But the peripheral is something that I really enjoyed. And it is, I believe, going into a second season and it needs to, to complete the story. Time travel science fiction stories like this, well, high concept ones, are something you can either do really well or you can do really badly. And from an engineering point of view, Primer really does it. It's worth checking out, and the Blu-ray itself is not that expensive if you want to pick it up. And if you're into science fiction at all, you've got to embrace the new as well as the old. And I think that this one, which is kind of medium new, even though it's 19 years old now, really delivers if you pay close attention to it. Now, the second one I've got for you is a movie that came out 10 years ago after a very problematic genesis. It was directed by Stephen Summers, who around the turn of the century was crazily popular with the Mummy series. And then in 2004, he started his own production company and he made a box office turkey called Van Helsing. If you've seen Van Helsing, you know what I mean. Even though it does star two good Australian actors, Hugh Jackman and um, Richard Roxburgh, it's still unwatchably bad in a modern context. He then made the G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra movie. And that tanked as well in the box office. And so Stephen Summers did a bit of producing, but really he's day in the sun as far as being a kind of first tier action director is concerned. Was a little bit over. Then in 2011, he made a movie that I'm going to talk about called Odd Thomas, based on a Dean Koontz novel, starring Anton Yolchin as the titular character and Willem Dafoe as the local police chief in the town of Picomundo. Odd is his first name, by the way. It's not because he's odd. It's one of those cute conceits they make in him. Now, Dean Kutz did a whole bunch of these novels based on this character, and Stephen Sommers obviously wanted to make a bit of a franchise here. Problem is, and I'll get all this stuff out of the way so I can talk about the movie itself. Problem is that the movie's production company got sued by another production company 
There were all sorts of legal stuff, and the movie wasn't actually released until 2013, and it didn't do well in the box office. Now, I find it an interesting film. It's very much in the style of Peter Jackson's The Frighteners, but it's um, got its own mojo, and it foreshadows some real-life problems in our real world. One of the problems with the film, I think, is there's a lot of front-end world-building that needs to get done so you understand what's happening. As I said, Odd Thomas is a psychic who lives in a town called Picamundo. It was actually filmed in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's a kind of psychic detective. The ghosts of dead people who can't talk but that he can see lead him toward their murderers. And he's got a relationship with the local police chief, a guy called Wyatt Porter, played by Willem Dafoe. And this is a nice, personable role by Willem Dafoe. And Anton Yelton's got a charisma that um, yeah, that kind of makes him able to lead a, a not particularly large budget movie like this. Budget was $27 million and the box office was $1.3, so it didn't help Stephen Summers long at all. And of course, a few years after this, Anton Yelchin died in an unfortunate car accident where a car rolled into him while he was opening a gate. Now, Odd has a girlfriend who works at an ice cream store. Her name is Stormy, played by Addison Timlin. And they've got a nice rapport. They've got their kind of cute, lovey-dovey kind of thing going on about them. And Stormy is very much comfortable with the psychic powers that Odd has. One day, Odd meets, sees a man he calls Fungus Bob. Now, the reason Fungus Bob draws the attention of Odd is that he is surrounded by otherworldly demon beings called Bodax, which only Odd can see. Occasionally other people can see them, but if the Bodax know that you can see them, they'll kill you, or arrange for you to be killed. But Ott has never seen this many Bodax around, and the Bodax are surrounding this weird guy, whose name turns out to be Robert Robertson, and then they suddenly they disappear. So Ott goes on this detective trail to track Robertson back to his home, and to see what's actually going on, and one of the weird things he finds is that there's a doorway to hell, in the shack in which Robertson lives. This then leads him through a whole bunch of adventures and some kind of psychic flash forwards that he has that tell him that something really, really, really catastrophic is going to happen in his little town and he's got to try to stop it. Now, this movie kind of works for me. I don't think it's perfect. I think that the third act revelations that end the movie... Uh, they're, they're very tonally different from the rest of the film. I think that there needed to be a little more of something else in there. Of course, the ending of it opens up for the sequels that never happened. It's got just enough gory bits without having too many to really, really put people off. And it's kind of like a mid-range movie from 10 years ago. And sometimes it's interesting to look at what movies came out that weren't really, really big 10 years ago. And even the ones that were really big, the attention horizon we've got for older movies is kind of weird at times. And not many people remember this movie, even though it has turned up on streaming services, but it did get a Blu-ray release. I love being able to do that. And it's um, it's a solid little film, Supernatural Themes and Violence. That pretty much tells you what it is. But um, a double feature between this and The Frighteners would be really instructive and interesting. And I think The Frighteners is a nice little uh, horror movie as well, which kind of looks weird to me because I could tell that it was filmed in New Zealand even though it's supposedly set in America and that always gives me kind of you know makes me geographically cross-eyed to watch it but nonetheless it's got a lot going for it but this one if you see it on streaming or you get the opportunity to pick it up cheaply and I think I picked this one up quite cheaply it is worth checking out uh Willem Dafoe's funny and gets a few plot beats the couple are cute, the detective revelations that happen in the movie are honest. There are so many movies that have kind of detectives looking for things and then a revolution and then a resolution comes out and the true villains are revealed. Some movies don't do that very well, but I think this one does it really well, which is kind of interesting for a movie that wasn't successful. Again, because it didn't have big names in it at the time and people's attention was starting to drift towards the MCU in an incredibly powerful way, which has kind of continued to this day. Odd Thomas didn't get a lot of love, but for me, it worked. Rewatching it wasn't an arduous task, it was entertaining, it was fun. I'd forgotten some of the third act revelations, which was good because I think you need to come with those fresh. But if you're in the mood for something that's kind of horror, 
but not nihilistically horrible, I think that this one definitely is one that you're going to look at and enjoy. That then brings me to the third movie, which is in some ways the most fun. Sorry if that last bit of audio is a bit laggy. I'm using a new camera, as you know. And the first rule of new cameras is something will go wrong the first time you use it. So let's talk about the third movie that we've got. It's a classic of Larry Cohen's oeuvre. It was around the time he did some really great films like the It's Alive trilogy. He did God Told Me To. He did The Stuff. Did a whole bunch of really cool movies. And this is definitely one of them. A little film called, he said, Bringing Up the Picture. Cue the Winged Serpent. Stars Michael Moriarty, David Carradine, Richard Roundtree, and also Candy Clark, who is really good in this one. And you all know the story. New York City, 1980s. There's a petty thief called Jimmy Quinn who finds the nest of a giant Aztec god, Quetzalcoatl the Winged Serpent which has been brought back to life by an Aztec fundamentalist nutcase who is sacrificing human beings in order to manifest his god. Now this is high concept for the 1980s and Larry Cohen had just made a movie called Eye of the Jury and he was thrown off the film towards the end of it because he wouldn't stop his actors from improvising. And the studio, and this was a fairly big studio, pictured with Armand Sante and Barbara Career and a whole bunch of other people in it. And the studio gave him the sack. So within two days, he's got a deal and he starts shooting this film. He's met Michael Moriarty. He knew David Carradine because Larry Cohen and David Carradine were in the army together in the 1950s. And so he, he kind of got the game together. Moriarty playing Jimmy Quinn brought a whole bunch of stuff to the picture. The piano playing stuff you see Jimmy do, which I put at the front of this video, is a skill Michael Moriarty had and which Larry Cohen incorporated into the movie. Go by way, people dream. Go by way now. It's just fantastic the way that the collaboration worked. And Michael Moriarty playing a guy who in some ways feels a bit similar to John Voight's Joe Buck in Midnight Cowboy, even though he isn't as dumb as Joe Buck is and he isn't as naive as Joe Buck is. He's still one of those guys who thinks he's smarter than he is, and that makes for really interesting filmmaking and a really interesting film. And New York in the 1980s was a really interesting place to make movies. The city was a, a shithole, as everybody knows. The government and the police were corrupt. There was tons of crime around. There was urban decay. There are all those good things that make movies look really beautiful. This film is definitely part of that and leans into it. The street scenes are shot beautifully and Larry Cohen had a real skill for shooting New York street scenes. All you've got to do is look at movies like Black Caesar and Hell Up in Harlem and God Told Me To, to know that. The guy knew his stuff and the guy really did film it in a way quite unlike many other movie makers. It, it just held together and then suddenly he threw in this enormously fantastic aspect of it. Being an ancient Aztec god, biting off people's heads, grabbing people out of swimming pools, grabbing women from the tops of buildings while they toplessly sunbathe and then scattering the blood all over the pedestrians down below. It's great high concept stuff. It's a bold movie to make. And it's incredibly, wonderfully entertaining. Supporting Moriarty, you've got Richard Rowtree playing one of the detectives. You've got David Carradine knowing that his tongue's going to be in his cheek in this film. And you've got the wonderful Candy Clark playing Joan, Jimmy's girlfriend, who puts up with a lot but knows that somewhere inside Jimmy Quinn, a good man is just waiting to come out and, and waiting for the right stimulus to emerge. And I like that character arc as well. Candy Clark had just such a groundedness. And, uh realism as an actress she was in the thing that anchored a movie like nicholas rogues the man who fell to earth you've got the kind of ethereal bowie playing the um alien newton and then you've got candy clark grounding everything at a human level and carrying that part of the film in a really fascinating way and she does that to a certain extent in this film as well i just love the way that larry cohen had the boldness to make this movie he was unashamedly uh, an exploitation filmmaker and was right to the end. He, he came up with brilliant concepts. 
and landed them. The idea of a yogurt that eats people, or the idea of a baby which is actually a hyper-intelligent feral monster. All of these things are, are stuff that you, in the wrong hands, wouldn't work. But Larry Cohen made it work tremendously well. And it doesn't take a lot to evoke the monster in this one too, which I really like. The shadow going across the skyscrapers. The quick shots of the stop motion monster. The action scenes with guys in gantries all around the Chrysler building where the nest is. Shooting at a monster that isn't really there with submachine guns. In the middle of New York City without most of the people in New York City knowing what all the gunfire was about. That's crazy bold stuff. And there's no way you can't love this movie. It has everything you want from an exploitation film. There's no one quite like Larry Cohen when it comes to this kind of film. And I love that. I love his audacity. I love his boldness. I love the quirky actors he's surrounded himself with to make. And I love the movie itself. It's just so much fun. So then the three movies for this time around. I liked all of them to varying degrees. I think they're very different films, but I think they're all part of that lower budget, entertaining, thought-provoking cinema that we all know and love. And it was fun to revisit them. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash paleocinema. Got another video coming up in a few days. Got another one coming up in a week. 2023 is going to be an interesting year. The Patreon supporters are getting some nice giveaways this year, thanks to the generosity of Imprint and Umbrella. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the year brings as far as new films are concerned, and also which old films I can find that I've never seen before. So anyway, until next time, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some B-grade films that didn't have big budgets, and I'll catch you next time.